With World War II now over, Zeiss Icon was able to return to the business of making cameras. Uh, these were uh, among the first cameras, more or less, well really the Iconta first, were among the first cameras to, um, to appear on the scene. One notable fact is that um, in its, what, 40 plus years of making cameras, it only ever made four folding 35 millimeter cameras. And that in itself is interesting uh, considering the proliferation of folding cameras on the market from really the 1930s, I guess I you could say, from the 1930s up until the mid-1950s when the entire industry began to transition away from folding cameras. So this isn't going to be a review of the three cameras. It's going to be an overview of the three cameras. At some point in the future, I will uh, take a deeper dive into these cameras and do, do a uh, review of each model. But this is really to give you an idea of uh, these three cameras, which are roughly related to each other, I suppose. Why, why did it take uh, three to four years to produce these models after World War II? The biggest reason is because Zeiss Icon's camera making facilities were now in the eastern zone, so Zeiss Icon had to more or less uh, start operations from scratch, or really what was left, or um, they, they really had to build up their operation in Stuttgart, which made a couple of cameras, but the bulk of its operations were, were now in the hands of the Soviet Union. That leads to another story involving the Kiev and I'll cover that at some point. These three are notable because they really represent uh, three different levels of, uh, of cameras. So first out of the gate was this model. This was the, I have a little bit of red paint, that's not actually blood. Uh, first out of the gate was this model. This was the I Iconta, uh, later renamed the Contina One. Next, uh, these two models followed not long after, even though it's marked as Contina. This later became known as Contina 2, at which point this was rebadged a Contina. It's a little confusing, but uh, stay with me. <laughs> Finally, there was the Contessa model. Uh, all three sort of represent different levels of complexity as far as the cameras go. This was a simple scale focus uh, camera. This had a... Un this had an uncoupled rangefinder, and then th and then this one had a selenium meter plus a coupled rangefinder. These two models came with either a Novar, or in some cases, I believe uh, there, I actually have a model with a Xenar or a Tessar, and uh, this one either came with a triplet. A no the Novar is a triplet, by the way. So this one either came with a Novar or a Tessar while the Contessa only came with a Tessar. As I mentioned, I'm not going to get too deeply into the variations within the models. I'll do that once I uh, delve deeper into uh, each model individually, but that'll be down the road. So let's take a look at these real quickly, uh, well, individually, <laughs> ironically. So first up, we have the Iconta. And uh, on the back, you can see how, you can see its name. This was uh, embossed in the leather. Iconta. Uh, later the badging moved to the front. This was a very simple camera. With all three of the cameras there was a little pin here that you pull down, pull the lens door. It's best if you actually pull the lens door from the front rather than, or you can pull from the sides until it snaps into place. Very simple to use. This uh, is a, you can just see a very faint coating, so this would be a single coated Novar. I thought I recalled seeing some uncoated uh, Novars with a couple of models. There are some variations within this model. And uh, like I said, when I do individual reviews of the cameras, I'll get into that. This particular camera had a very uh, simple uh, shutter. Oh, this, this one uh, actually had full range of speeds, but although its top speed was 1 250th of a second. It has a leaf shutter. It has a uh, scale focus. This particular camera, as you can see, or not see, this particular camera is marked in meters. So you had to, um, for those of us who live in America, you have to do that um, meters to conversion feet, which is roughly, uh, one meter equals roughly three feet. And for this camera, it's probably good enough. I uh, had apertures running from f3.5 to f22. You can see how Zeiss Icon was imprinted 
embossed into the uh, top deck. You, one thing you'll notice it doesn't have, well, let's, let's take a quick look at the bottom. The base plate for most, for all three of these cameras was very similar. You had your frame counter, you had your film advance, or your film advance on this side, and you had your rewind button, your rewind, uh, your rewind uh, knob. And you can see how these are marked A for advance, then R for rewind. To rewind the film with all three cameras, you press and hold this button in the center of the advance, and then you turn this. So you have to uh, hold that button down while you rewind your film. Not incredibly difficult, but it is sort of a pain because, you know, doing it in very, very small increments. You might be able to pull this out slightly. Let's take a look. Uh, to collapse the lenses on all these cameras, they have these little, uh, I, I just call them ears. They have these little ears on the side. Push them inward, closes, then the door closes. There were no no such thing as frame lines or parallax marks. Uh, not that parallax is going to be a big issue with this camera. This was just a very simple viewfinder. To open the back on all three cameras, you pull down this little tab, and the back then opens. Inside, it's very simple. You have your pressure plate. The pressure plate's purpose is to keep the film flat against the uh, film rails and across the film plane. That, that provides you as sharp a photo as possible, uh, which is all dependent on the sharpness of the lens or the ability of the lens to create a sharp image. Uh, here's your take-up spool, and then here is your, here's, uh, here's where your fresh roll film spools. Film runs right to left. No surprises there. To load the film, you always have to pull out the rewind knob. Then as you put it in here, you have to align that cross that's inside of a um, inside of the uh, film cassette. As I mentioned, your frame counter is here, manually set. One thing to note is you had to tension the shutter for every, every time you took the photo. Uh, all of these cameras had double exposure prevention. Oh, you also had to manually, of course, set your shutter speeds and your uh, shut your set your shutter speeds and your aperture. This had a front-mounted shutter release, as did the other two. As I mentioned, the the Iconta was the simplest of the three cameras: scale, focus, and uh, uh, no rangefinder or really no, nothing else. It's also the smallest of the three cameras. Next up is the Contina 2. When the Contina 2 was released, I believe at that point the Iconta was renamed Contina. Uh, informally it became known as Contina 1 or simply Contina. To open this camera, it's the same as the others. Pull down this small little tab or post, pull out on the lens door till it locks into place. This particular model has a coded Tessar. This had uh, an uncoupled rangefinder. So what that meant is, well, take a look on the back. So on the back you have two windows, one for uh, focusing and one for viewing. This one actually is for focusing, this one is for composing your shot. How do I know that? Uh, I just know that. Because <laughs> I've used this camera many times before, that's how I know it. So with this one, uh, what you would do is you would, using a traditional rangefinder type setup of overlapping images, you would um, focus your shot, then you would then read the distance from the scale. You would then read the distance from the scale and you would set your lens accordingly. So let's say, for example, yours was just past six feet, so then you would set the, uh, the lens uh, to just past six feet. It's a very accurate system. I've never had a problem with it. It does tend to slow you down a little bit, but um, not by um, not by a terrible amount. However, it does mean that uh, photography is a bit, becomes a very deliberative process, which it should anyway. A uh, little film minder on the back. Uh, once again, to open the uh, back. Oh, I have some film in this one. How about that? I'm not going to open the back. Once again, though, to open the back, you would pull down this lever. Same thing. Tension the shutter. This is your film release. This 
lever with the green dot, that is your self timer. This is a synchro compier shutter. Synchro means it synchronizes with flash. And here's your little flash post. Uh, because it's a compier shutter, this one has speeds running from, let's see if you can read that. This camera has speeds running from 1 500th of a second all the way down to 1 second plus B. With uh, most of your compier shutters, uh, and depending on the camera, uh, particularly those uh, what you would call rim set shutter, which means you turn this little rim here, uh, uh, if you're going to select 1 500th of a second, you should do that before you tension the shutter. There's a heavy coiled spring in here that has to be pushed to the side in order for the 1 500th of a second to be actuated. So in this case, you would force that over to the left, then, then tension your shutter, then take your photo. This is the same where you will manually set your aperture and your shutter speeds before taking your photograph. And once again, to collapse the camera, press in these little ears or these little panels on the side. Lens door closes, push it until you hear a click. Very, very simple. This is slightly thicker than the other camera. You can sort of see that. You can see how that top deck is slightly thicker. Uh, and it's uh, slightly heavier. Well, let's see how much. Well, you know what? Let's weigh all three cameras at the end and we'll take a look. Finally, we have the Contessa. The Contessa uh, had all the conveniences that you really wanted for a camera of that era. And this is uh, visually striking. It's visually different from the other cameras. This had a two-zone, uh, I think a two-zone, yeah, I guess you could call it a two-zone meter. So uh, when you're metering indoor, indoors, you would open the flap, and when you were outdoors, you would close the flap. I'll go over this at some point. Uh, this had an integrated uh, integrated range, an integrated coupled range finder, so you could focus in your, and compose your shot in one window. You'll notice that this was meant for the European market because this is marked DIN and DIN was the European designation for film speeds. So this camera worked best, the Contessa worked best if you held your, uh, if you cradled the camera in your left hand and used your thumb and index finger for focusing. You could then hold your, use your right index finger to depress the shutter release. Uh, this has worked very well for me. Uh, through the years, I've taken a number of photos with this camera and have always been satisfied with it. Let me show you a real quick difference among the three cameras. So the Contessa was the premium model, and uh, this had a couple of little nice features. One was this, this small tab that extended, and the sole purpose of the tab was to allow the camera to sit upright. Uh, without the tab, the camera wants to tilt back toward the rear, and to close it, you simply push this in this direction and slide it back into the body. Very, very simple. Uh, this also applied some leather here and had Zeiss Icon right there. Whereas these, the other two models did not. They were just plain, you know, enameled metal, as you can see. The quality of construction of all three cameras, uh, all three cameras was very high. I've never had a problem with any of these cameras as far as the quality goes. Although I have run, of, of course, run into beaten up cameras, and you know, that's just uh, that just happens over time. If you see enough cameras, you see some that haven't really been treated uh, very well, which is surprising because even during that era, German cameras were still relatively expensive. Let's see what these cameras weigh. The Iconta weighs 15.5 ounces, so we could say one pound. The Contina 2 weighs, the Contina 2 weighs one pound three ounces. So it weighs about three ounces more than the Iconta. And the Contessa weighs one pound five ounces. So uh, in order, let's put these, 
one pound, one pound three ounces, one pound five ounces. No surprise, I fully expected that. Actually, I expected the Contessa to even weigh a bit more, so that's impressive that they were able to add uh, uh, a number of features, worthwhile features, but not appreciably to the weight, overall weight of the camera. So if you are looking for some, for some relatively simple but very high quality uh, 35 millimeter cameras, take a look at one of these three. The Iconta, the Contina 2, or the Contessa. I hope you enjoyed this video and don't forget to hit that like or subscribe button. If you'd like to see me cover a particular camera, uh, please let me know in the comments below or send me an email at contact at camera-talk.net. Until next time, keep on taking photographs. So let's weigh these three cameras and Well, maybe not. My battery's dead.